Lars, there's so much that we have to ask you and I want to start with what inspired Concordium and if you can tell us a little bit about the team behind it. Well, I became aware of Bitcoin quite early on, like 2012 or 2011, around about there, and I was quite excited about it. I thought it was an interesting new technology, but I also got more and more skeptical of the early generations with their anonymity, some technical problems, not very scalable, of course, the electricity use that many people are aware of. So I thought uh, around uh, four years ago, I thought, why not build my own project where we take all of the great things of a distributed blockchain, which are many, uh, and then we combine it with sort of normal expectations and reasonable requirements from society. So on Concordium, uh, you cannot be anonymous. Uh, it's scalable. There's a good balance between privacy and accountability. And uh, we, have, we have solved the energy problem as well. The way I did that was uh, I went out and hired people that are smarter than myself. That's always a good, good way to get things done well. So I, I, I signed up a lot of uh, very, very uh, great scientists, cryptographic scientists that we work with across multiple universities, particularly Aarhus University in Denmark, which is one of the finest cryptographic departments in the world. And then we have built a, a tech building department, which is more of a corporate tech. You know, you build it like you would in Saxo Bank or in uh, in, a, in a big corporate business. Uh, and and finally, we have some people that have, you know, traditional business experience. Uh, clearly myself, but also people like uh, Lorna Finn uh, who is uh, vice chairman of Volvo Cars and on the IKEA board. And we have uh, as an advisor the former uh, head of the Scandinavian Stock Exchanges, uh, NASDAQ uh, in Scandinavia. So we have this combination of world class science, a very strong, solid tech building process, and then we have these people that have real experience in, in, in the businesses that we actually want to appeal to going forward. It sounds like we're in good hands. Uh, tell us what are the key differences between Concordium and the existing market players? I would say a number of things. Uh, the very most important thing, which is actually more ideological than technological, is that we insist on people being identified as they access the blockchain. That doesn't mean that we display their identity everywhere, but under certain circumstances due after due process, if you really need to know who's behind some transaction, you can you can find that. And the person that, that is on the blockchain can choose to release certain aspects of their own identity for entering into various businesses or use cases. So that's very important. You cannot be anonymous on this blockchain. Also very important for NFTs because you know that whoever sells you an NFT is actually that person. Uh, the other things are things like scalability where really there's major problems with many of the early generations that can't scale. So doing transactions on the blockchain can cost even hundreds of dollars to do a transaction. Here we have one flat stable fee of one euro cent for for example, minting an NFT, so you can build a long-term use case on that basis. And finally, something that's on very many people's minds is uh, sustainability, uh, the CO2 impact, and, and we have found, not just us, but a number of more modern blockchains found ways to uh, eliminate this uh, huge electricity use from, from the early generations. And in fact, we go the step further, the very little energy that's used by, by using our blockchain, because nearly anything consumes some energy, we offset completely, so it's a net zero impact on 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 uh, on co2 and on, on on and very very reduced electricity use so this is the proof of stake that that you use as the technology as well as what I can make out is that the users have a lot more security uh, knowing where uh, being able to trace back on the blockchain the anonymity is reduced it's, it's eliminated, I would say, but but privacy is not. This is very important to say. Uh, we, we're not putting people's identity out for everybody to see. That would also be a breach of GDPR and virus data laws. But we, we, we put a pointer on an account, so ultimately, subject to due process, one, an authority would be able to identify that individual, and secondly, very importantly, you can, you can release the amount of information that you want. So if somebody says, well, I would like to sell you a chess NFT, and, and this is from Magnus Carlsen, for example, well, I would like to be sure it's Magnus Carlsen selling me that NFT, so he can prove to me that he is, in fact, the issuer of that NFT, and ultimately, I can prove to him that uh, who I am, if he requires it from me, I can also choose to say no, but then he probably won't do the deal with me. So the ID is back in the hands of the owners and the people that, that, that trade on it. It's not like many of the social media where we blindly hand over ID to other people to make money 
turning off and to use in various ways. Here you can be absolutely certain that uh, if somebody says that they are a given person and hence, for example, try to sell you a chess NFT, well, they are that person. We can show that with 100% mathematical uh, proof. So, so this is a very important difference from the anonymity on many of the other chains out there. And this has been a big challenge for the blockchain world. It's a huge challenge because if you see on some of the NFT platforms out there, there's a rampant fraud. You know, there are lots of people out there whose name and intellectual property are being abused by anonymous uh, issuers of NFTs that other people buy in good faith, often at very high, high values. But at the end of the day, it has nothing to do with the, with the person that they, uh, the artwork or the, even the chess move that they may portray. So I think it's essential to NFTs that you're able to have this guarantee that whoever you're dealing with is in fact that person. What is the value of a Picasso if it's painted by somebody else, right? Uh, so so this, is, this is a very important point and, and not fully understood yet, but I'm sure that it will be very well understood uh, uh, sooner than we think, because it's obvious for, for NFTs that you need to be sure that who you're buying from is in fact uh, the person that you want to be buying it from. Yeah. Now Lars, you've partnered up with the Play Magnus Group uh, for the NFT collection for the Champions Chess Store. In this world of blockchain technology and NFTs, where does chess fit in? Well, I actually think that chess and blockchain is a wonderful match. They're sort of you know, cryptography. These are intellectual, intellectual plays, if you will. You know, I'm sure uh, somebody like uh, Magnus would be able to read some of the cryptographic papers and understand some of the stuff that's in it. Uh, and, and actually, many of our scientists love chess, so that's also because they're kind of chessy people, you know. So I think there's a very good match in the intellectual challenges of building this stuff and playing the, the most sophisticated game out there. So I really like the match and of course also when we're looking at something just like Play Magnus Group that uh, you want to see real adoption, you want to build real, a real business case around it, that's of course also interesting for us. And, and I think this is one of the things that is on the up in the world chess today. I'm sure the pandemic played a very positive role for that particular aspect because people got time to sit and do different things. And I think the obvious next step is to also monetize that and, and get people engaged and create new fan groups that can actually own a piece of genuine property uh, on, on a blockchain from an NFT that they know derives from some of the greatest place, place, uh, chess players in the world. And I, I think that's a very, very good match. And I think it's something that can help build the NFT market, but I also think it's something that can help build the chess market. Mm, absolutely. It makes the users have a very interactive way to be fans and to, to interact with their idols and, and the game. That's and very, it sort of gamifies the experience. Yeah, well. I mean, you can also do that. Of course, chess already is the best game, if you will, that exists. So you got to be careful not to tread on any toes, but I'm sure you could find ways to also get new people in that actually don't know the full rules of chess and, and show them little parts of chess, maybe playing with, with see if they can work out certain moves from, from a limited position, etc. So I think we can also open for and excite new people about chess. But I think at the end of the day, that the, the direct relationship you now get to your icons is very different from watching a YouTube video or something of, of somebody that that you really look up to, to now actually being directly engaged by owning a piece of, of property or intellectual property that, that this person has made specially to engage his fans. So I think just as we see in other areas with artists, etc., I think chess players will find that they build a much more close community around their fan bases or the, the people that see them as iconic figures and, and they'll have much closer interaction with them, the ability to communicate much better with them because they get this tighter relationship relationship once you you own something that your biggest star does and I mean in the old days you could buy a record or something right if you like the band but now you can probably buy a, a chess chess move or a chess match or something and in many ways th that possibility hasn't really been there because it was all like intellectual stuff that you could read and understand but actually owning a piece of the action and maybe be play with that with other people that are interested in the same thing as you or exchanging them or building up a collection I think there are really great opportunities that we've seen in some other sports but not so much in chess just just yet and NFTs, I think, is a very, very good, good way to get to that community building. What personally led you to the game of chess? Well, I, I uh, first of all, like when I was a kid, you know, I, uh, I, I was there watching when it was almost a Cold War thing and they were playing in Iceland and everybody was following this with trepidation, you know, the excitement of Fischer versus Spassky, I think it was at the time, right? 
and uh, so, so I was kind of fascinated. I was never very good at it. I'm not, unfortunately, nearly as good as you were when, when you were a kid, and certainly not the way you are now. But uh, but I did like it, and I did play with my dad sometimes. Uh, and since then, it's something. Whenever I hear about something about chess or a new world champion, well, that doesn't happen so much recently. But but uh, whenever you hear about some excitement going on. I, I, I like to follow it a little bit, I and mean, then generally I'm a passion-driven person. You know, as you said, I have some great restaurants, I have some uh, football club and an ice hockey club that I love and I enjoy being engaged with. And, and and now I get a chance to sort of revive something that meant something to me in my childhood. I have to be honest, I haven't played much the last 30 years because life's been too busy. But uh, so I hope I don't get sucked into a new rabbit hole here. So I also have to spend hours every day on chess. But I'm very excited to get into this project and, and revive the little I know about chess and then learn new stuff and new formats. And there's so much that happened in chess since I was like a kid and watched uh, Fischer play, right? The viewers from across the world who will be watching the tour can own these NFTs and uh, through the Chess24 broadcast and by having a Concordium wallet. What are the kind of benefits that these users can experience and expect? Well, first of all, by simply opening an account on, uh, on the Concordium network, they will get this uh, portable ID uh, that, that actually enables them to prove with 100% certainty in various contexts that they are the person that they claim to be. Also, they can only release some of it. You know, if you are in a kiosk, you need to prove you're 18 so you can buy a bottle of wine. You don't need to show your home address and everything else for that purpose, right? And, and there will be a number of exciting use cases launching on uh, on Concordium as we go forward. But in this particular case, uh, we will we will already now we have already now today I think announced a, an NFT drop where people can go in and buy the the first of many exciting NFTs uh, related to the Play Magnus Group. And uh, of course there will be more. And ultimately we will build exciting universes where they can play, they can play with other people, they can collect various uh, relevant items and uh, I, I think they, if they're interested in chess, even if they're a little bit, oh blockchain, what's that? We were trying to make it very easy, so don't worry about it, it's like maybe a two minute process to, to open an account uh, and, 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 and off you are. And then you can start collecting and you can start uh, being part of that universe, which we uh, are starting now. And, and then now we expect to grow it into something more and more exciting with, with the Play Magnus Group uh, as time goes by. What, according to you, with your expertise that you have, is the future of NFTs? NFTs is really very close to something else we call tokenization, which in essence is you take the token on a blockchain and you privatize it, right? And then you can really use it for very many things. Of course, you can, you can, you can put a digital uh, figure or, for example, in this case, something related to chess could be an artwork, could be a music right, could be a land register, could be that you share the ownership of a Ferrari from 1965 that you can never, you can never buy yourself, but with a thousand other people, maybe you can share that ownership. So there are very many things. I, I'm a great, great believer in blockchain, uh, NFT slash tokenization is the key functionality of blockchain in many ways. So I think that it can be used for very many purposes. And, and already now you're seeing people coming up with more and more ideas for how we make this exciting. Now I have to say, I was a very early adopter of the internet. I'm that old that I can remember that. And, and we got we built Saxo Bank on the basis of that and, and, and were very early to, to make our first platform when there were, I think, less than 50 million users of the internet in the world. We had a similar stage here. And I have to say, for those 25 years that I waited, I've never seen anything as transformative and as exciting as the blockchain since the internet. In between, there's been many interesting things, but this has a real potential to transform the world economy and improve it and also spread out to people that are very hard to include today. And so I'm very excited about blockchain. And right now I'm directing nearly all my investments in, in that direction because to me, it's, it has massive transformative potential and people shouldn't be scared of it. You know, we didn't understand how the internet worked back in the day. You don't need to necessarily understand every aspect of it. Just just look for people to help you into it in a smooth way and benefit from, from the improved functionality that you get. You don't have to be a cryptographic professor yourself to use it. And it is actually easier than many people think. Uh, especially with the ease of use on the Concordium platform. 
But we try to make it as easy as possible, and that's a, a very important objective for us as well. Because some of this stuff, and it has to be like that in the early generations, is created by nerds, it's created by people that are very technical, and they, they don't mind it being technical because they understand it. But when you want the broader adoption of it, of course you need to do interfaces that just like you had browsers in the beginning, you didn't even have browsers to the internet, you had to sit and, and, and do very complex things to even look at something on the internet, right? But then people started building applications that made it easier and easier and easier to engage with. And today, I mean, it doesn't matter what age group, whatever, everybody can use the internet. You find somebody that can truly explain how the internet works, because that's still pretty complicated, but you don't need to know. You need to know that it improves your life, and improves your possibilities, and it's exactly the same with blockchain. And we're trying to be some of those people that, that make it easy to use, that, that provide the bridge between all the nerds and the people out there that just want a better life and, a, and more exciting opportunities to work with, right? Yeah, and ours, uh, the Champions Chess Star is watched by hundreds of thousands of people from across the world, from different parts of the world. And if there was one advice that you wanted to give out to uh, spectators, lovers of the game, and users who want to get into NFT but are unsure about it, what would be your advice to them? Well, first of all, anything you're unsure about, you just have to try it, right? And then if it's not for you, it's not for you. Maybe you have to wait another three years before it is for you, you know? The, so so this, you've got to try some stuff, right? The beauty, now you say all over the world, the beauty of the blockchain and the internet for that matter, is how you can so easily interact with people all over the world, right? You can do transactions with people at the other end of the world. You can share your, your NFTs with other people or swap them, what do I know? And imagine when, when I was a kid, I used to do correspondence chess. You know, I wrote a letter, sent it to somebody, and then I sat and waited for three days before their move came back to me, right? I mean, this is how much the world has moved, in, even in chess terms, right? So it's just about getting started, and I think we, we have tried here together with Play, Play Magnus uh, Group and uh, Concordium and, and the Space 7 place where you actually find them. Uh, we have tried to make it as easy to get on board as possible. Uh, and, and it is easy. It's really literally a couple of minutes and you are off and running and you can start collecting your very first NFT and then you're off to a start. And maybe you can use it for many other things as, as the time develops and you develop your understanding. But right now, if you're a chess fan, seems to be the obvious place to start, right? But tell me one thing, there's so much interest in our game as well, from these different industries. What do you think as a brand, as a big company, being who you are in the finance world, what does chess as a sport add to the profile of a brand? I think it, uh, you know, there are many things you do and, and, and branding is very important today. You've got all the sustainability uh, aspects, all the governance aspects, you have to behave appropriately wherever you produce your goods, etc. You have to, well beyond the legal framework and the laws, actually consumers today demand that you behave in certain ways. And, and you, so you, everybody works a lot with their brand. And I think what, what chess certainly adds is a certain intellectual superiority to many of the other things, if you will, right? So I think a company that wants to be seen as smart and, 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 and intelligent and building intelligent things, you know, I think chess is a good match because people always tend to say, well, you know, if they're smart enough to play chess, they're probably smart enough to do the other stuff that they're selling me. And I know that from, from like, in, in, in when I was in heavily uh, sponsoring cycling many years ago, and we, we had one of the teams, Axe Bank, won the Tour de France and won everything under the sun. And we were a small bank back then, but people were saying, well, if they have like a world-class cycling team, probably do the rest of what they do also in a good way and then they, they also are world class in that aspect. So it's also the psychological aspect. You know, you know if you're associated with an intellectual sport like chess, you're not probably not full of idiots in the rest of the organization, right? So I think chess has that nice intellectual feel to it. So companies I want to brand them in that way. It's also a very broad sport of course, so it's respectful. It's something that can be played it irrespective of economic means, you know, if you want to do motor racing, you know, that's not something you can do unless you have a millionaire father, right? But you can buy a chessboard for a couple of bucks and you can actually get one of the greatest intellectual learning curves of your life. So it's also a very inclusive sport in many ways. And of course, with all the online opportunities and these new blockchain and opportunities, it's very engaging across, across the globe where many people have better opportunities than others, and the people that don't have so great opportunities of doing stuff that requires a lot of economic resource actually can can thrive for something that, that is much more accessible in economic terms, and I think that's the beauty of, of chess as well. Wow. 
Yeah, after listening to this, I think uh, the Play Magnus Group and a Concordium partnership is just so fitting. An absolute win-win for both and the chess world. Thank you so much, Lars. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you. you. I look forward to the, to the relationship.